relationships with any commercial interests related to this activity. Those of you seeking continuing medical education, you should have received two pieces of paper on the way in. The small one is for you to fill out and leave at the registration table. The larger piece is for you to take with you and remember in two to four weeks to look at the information on that piece of paper and go online to claim, claim your credit. For the rest of you, we do care about your feedback and there is a link, an electronic link on the back of the program which you can use with your smartphone and you can go online and fill out a survey and tell us how you felt about this presentation today. Now, a few words about Dr. Frank Bryant, for whom our lecture is named. Dr. Bryant was a much-loved family physician and a community leader in San Antonio until his premature death in 1999. He's among the first African-American students to graduate from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, and he went on to become an important advocate for the medically underserved living on San Antonio's east side. He co-founded the Ella Austin Health Clinic, where he was the first medical director, and he also co-developed the East San Antonio Medical Center. He served as the first African-American president of the Bear County Medical Society and the first president of the C.A. Whittier Medical Society. I also want to say a couple of words about our topic today. Dialogue about race is a charged subject in our country. It is challenging and it has rocked our cities and our universities with renewed energy over the last several years. None of the underlying issues are new. But when we fail for centuries to acknowledge and address our hidden biases, these internal prejudices find destructive ways of externalizing themselves. Today, April 19th, is the anniversary of the death of Freddie Gray. He was a 25-year-old black man in Baltimore, arrested for the possession of a switchblade. He died after what was called a rough ride to police headquarters. The cause of death was injury to the spinal cord. The officers involved were charged with second-degree depraved heart murder, assault, manslaughter by a vehicle, misconduct in office, and reckless endangerment. Many of you know that the city of Baltimore rose up as a result in an ongoing series of major protests against racism and police brutality. Civil disorder, looting, burning, and a state of emergency in Baltimore ensued. This is something that happened not 200 years ago. This happened last year, and it's just one example. I bring up this story from our history, our recent history, to remind us that when we bury painful truths, like our intrinsic mistrust of people whom we perceive to be different from ourselves, when we bury disturbing truths down in the recesses of our consciousness, they inevitably resurge and manifest themselves in ways that cause great harm, not only to individual lives, but to the very fabric of our society. If we don't choose to disturb ourselves, to discern our disease and try to cure it, the disease rises up. It undermines our human civilization. Today's Frank Bryant Memorial Lecturer, Dr. Damon Tweedy, has faced many manifestations of intrinsic bias, both personally and professionally. We are grateful to Dr. Tweedy, a learned psychiatrist from Duke University, and author of Black Man in a White Coat, A Doctor's Reflections on Race and Medicine, for his willingness to speak out and to educate us about how racism impacts not only our practice of medicine, but the way in which we recruit and educate future health professionals and the way we deliver health care to Americans. Dr. Frank Bryant would have agreed with Dr. Tweedy, who has said, being black can be bad for your health. And Dr. Bryant was a San Antonio hero who tried to do something about that. He lived his life in a way that said health care should be available to everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status and regardless of the color of their skin. Please help me welcome Dr. Damon Tweedy.
So uh, thanks for that you know, wonderful introduction. And, and it's really an honor to, I had a chance to read a little bit about Dr. Bryant before coming here today and seeing his family. It's, it's, it's an honor to be here and to see some of the uh, previous speakers who come to participate in this lecture. It's really an honor to be part of this uh, larger uh, you know, tradition now that you have here. Um, so the reason why I'm here is that last fall I, I published a book, as you see here, um, Black Man in a White Coat. So it came out in September. And it was you know, published to a lot more. Initially, and I will get into this more later, I thought it would be a really sort of small project, wouldn't get a, much attention at all. And it's certain, it's, in some ways, it's been a complete opposite of that. And so it's allowed me a, a platform that I never really envisioned having. And so certainly, um, it's, it's a tremendous honor. And what I wanted to do with the time I have today is to tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, about the book and about my experiences uh, that sort of informed the book but also what my own story as an individual sort of means to this larger kind of dialogue about race and medicine. So let's start with the title. So the title is uh, Black Man in a White Coat. So you know, the, the, actually, I came with the title myself. And uh, I was in the shower one day. Uh, and normally when I'm in the shower, I just sing really bad songs off key. Um, but this one particular day, I had a, uh, some inspiration, I guess you could say. And the white coat was hanging up on the little rack there. And I got out the shower, got dressed. And it just sort of just kind of came to me, this whole idea of black man in a white coat. It was just, I can't really say it, can't grasp it any other way. And so there's a literal meaning to it, right? The physical manifestation of being a, a black man in a white coat. But then there's also a symbolism, this idea of having two identities, this idea of being a young black man in American society and all the things that that entails, good and bad. Uh, but also the, being a white coat, being a member of the medical profession. And so, and so these are two very different identities. And so the, much of the book really talks about the ways in which these identities merge and clash. And so that's really at the heart of the stories I tell. So the book is really two stories in one. Two stories in one. So uh, the one story is the story that you talked about with Dr. Bryant of this, this challenges of African American patients, the challenges that we face in the country and also within the, the healthcare system. So that's one integral part of the story. And what I do in this story, a lot of, a lot of it's known about these issues, but I, what I try and do is personalize it, to use the stories of real people to illustrate how these problems are impacting people in the real world, uh, these larger issues. It's also a story about my own journey as a young African-American man going through the medical training process and the ways in which my experiences were very unique from others. So it's really these two stories melted into one. So I know this, there's, a, there's a CME uh, requirement here, so I'm going to kind of, this slide will sort of guide you through that. I call this the uh, MD version of my uh, uh, slides because it's often for medical audiences. And so you can see that the goals here, there, there's several goals. So one is that you're going to get a better sense of the health disparities that are impactful in the primary care and mental health fields. Those are the fields that I know most about, but the truth is, truth is that these uh, issues are relevant in all areas of medicine. Uh, it's just that these are the areas that I've had most personal experience with. I'm in psychiatry myself. My wife is in primary care. So these are the areas that we know the most about, but they inform all areas of medicine. And then I'm going to take you through some slides that look at numbers. And I think this will be pretty interesting. You'll look at some of the, 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 the disparities in terms of the patient populations, in terms of the demographics of the communities where people, uh, where doctors are being trained. So you'll see the differences between the numbers of doctors that are minorities and the numbers of the patients that they're serving. And, you'll, and I'll show you some interesting uh, data points about that and what, that, what the implications of those are. And then here we'll look at some uh, issues about the role of minority physicians in the care of, of the African American uh, patient population as well. So this is just sort of the kind of the nuts and bolts part about what the book's about, why did I write it, um, you know, what did I learn, where did we go from here. And I think this last part's particularly interesting because I'm going to give you some idea. The book's been out in the world now about seven months, and I want to give you a sense of some of the feedback that I received. In some ways, it informs uh, where we've come in terms of progress, but also some of the limitations of that progress. There'll be some really, um, really uncomfortable things that you, you'll see that have been said uh, to me and about some of the things um, that I've written. So I think that's also interesting because it tells about this larger story as well. So, you know, the idea of the book, um, if someone were, the way it all sort of came about for me was uh, I was interested in medical books, medical stories. I was always interested in those kind of books. Um, there's some sub famous authors from this university here as well that I, that I learned about today. And um, these medical stories, while I really enjoy them, they, there was a part that was missing. They weren't talking about this experience of the minority patient, the African American patient in particular, the challenge they were facing, but also the challenge of African American providers. It was almost like a story, it was a story that wasn't being told and I wanted to contribute to that larger dialogue. It was almost like I wanted to write a story that in some ways spoke to this larger problem. And so that was sort of the, the idea, which I was, it started with an interest in writing and it became something more than that. And so that's sort of how uh, the book you know, evolved itself. So let me just kind of advance a few, a few slides here. 
just talked about. So these are some of the books. So again, some of these books, are, they're all really well-written books. Um, but I wanted to sort of tell a, a story that contributed uh, in my own way to, to this larger conversation. Now, when I started medical school, I wasn't someone that 20 years ago I started medical school, 1996. It's hard to believe it's been that long. I wouldn't have been someone that you would have imagined one day 20 years later being the person here writing this book. So I grew up in a, in a um, lower middle class African American community, not 100% African American. And I clearly was aware of the, 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 the challenges that came with that. But I was, in some ways, I'd always had my head down, did well in school, and, and kind of felt like I was, in some ways, transcending the, 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 these, these problems that were inherent in society, right? That was sort of the mindset that I came to medical school with. I wanted to become a cardiologist, uh, and the thought was that I was going to, you know, unclog arteries, and an artery is the same no matter, on the inside, no matter what you look like on the outside. That was sort of this kind of frame of mind, this sort of post-racial kind of aspiration that I had when I started medical school. But th several things happened when I uh, got to medical school, um, both in terms of what I learned in the classroom as well, also as, as well as what happened to me in personal life, that began to sort of change my perspective and sort of get, guide me on the path to where I am today. So uh, as a first year medical student, uh, so Duke, it, it, we do this strange curriculum where you do everything in one year in terms of the classroom. It's pretty, uh, it's kind of strange. Uh, I think we were the only school that does it that way. Um, and there's good and bad with that, but so what happens is that they really compress everything into that first year in terms of all the, the lectures on diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And so we kind of get through everything really quickly. You go through things really fast. And when we learn about diseases, say common things like high blood pressure or diabetes, right? So you would start with uh, the physiology, how it affected the body, this sort of thing. But then they would always kind of eventually in the lecture, they would go to the sort of the social implications, like what are the demographic factors? Who's affected more, men or women? young or old. And so whenever that conversation would drift towards race and ethnicity, there would be this sort of refrain, this sort of ugly refrain that would always come up. It would always be that the, the disease was more, so disease X, as I say, was more common in blacks than in whites. And then even if the disease was, was, it, uh, was uncommon in African Americans, they would say, well, well, African Americans who get this disease have a worse course. And it would be this sort of refrain over and over again. But there wasn't any context to put, put to that. It was just sort of like disease, race was a risk factor for disease, but there was no understanding as to why or what that meant or what could be done about it. And that was sort of this story that was happening over and over and over again. And so, and this is, next slide just sort of illustrates some of the examples. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is that it, basically any area you looked at in medicine, you see these same sort of stories play out, whether it was the beginning of life, you know, or the, or the end of life and everything in between. And so these are just some examples of, of these problems. So one of the things that was, was in some ways troubling to me was this whole framing of the, the discussion between black and white. And that's sort of how it was framed. And, and so it still, it still continues to be framed that way. Uh, and so that was problematic to me. But then beyond sort of the um, thought, so this is sort of how I interpreted what they were saying, because there was no context to it, right? So being black is somehow bad for your health, but what does that mean? And where can we go from here? What can we do about it, right? Um, so that was a part for me that was really troubling, because I'll be in a classroom. It wasn't quite this large, but I was in a classroom, and I'll be one of the few minority students looking around a classroom, wondering what the classmates around me were thinking about these issues. Was it something that even registered on their, you know, on their radar? Was it just in one ear, out the other? Was it just a box to check off? What did it matter? Well, it mattered to me quite a bit from an from a intellectual standpoint, but it also mattered from a personal standpoint. And the next couple slides will illustrate that how it became more than just something that was an academic sort of exercise. So this is a picture of my maternal grandmother. So this is uh, uh, in the last couple years of her life. So she's actually the only uh, grandparent that I knew. So my, my dad was the youngest of, uh, well, the ninth of 10 children. So by the time he was around, his parents were, were up in age. And so I never got a chance to meet my grandparents on my dad's side. But on my mom's side, this was the, my mom was raised by a single mother. And so this is my grandparent that I knew. And so, you know, we, we, she lived in the Washington, D.C. area, and after church uh, on Sundays, uh, we would go visit her, and she'd tell us about life, you know, growing up and those sorts of things. And so from a health standpoint, uh, she had a long history of high blood pressure, hypertension. I knew that. But during her senior year of college, she started to develop complications from that. So she had a couple strokes, and the last one caused physical and mental sort of impairments, and it was pretty, pretty noticeable, and, 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 and so there was a clear decline. During the summer before I started, college, started medical school, she um, developed heart failure. And that rapidly progressed, and she died uh, in my first year of medical school, right before I was getting ready to start my gross anatomy um, lab. I remember that uh, pretty vividly. And so hypertension, 
strokes and heart failure. You see, they're all diseases that are more common among African Americans and have a worse course. So this was, that narrative that I was hearing about in the classroom was playing out in uh, my own personal life. And the story became more personal several months later. So this is me as a uh, first year medical student. Um, I can't find any picture of me being happy as a medical student. I don't know what that, <laughs> I don't know. I, I tried and tried, I just didn't, couldn't find one. Uh, so I don't know what that says. Um, so uh, anyway, this is me as a first year medical student. And as you can see, um, uh, my, my sense of, a, of attire was a little off too. I had, I had on a black coat, blue pants, and I actually had on brown shoes, so it was just a little bit off. Um, I've come a little ways, uh, thanks to my wife now. Um, so, so about six months after, uh, you know, that first, after my grandmother passed away, so those of you who are physicians in the audience know, or nurses or whatever, you know that when you learn the basics of clinical skills, checking blood pressures, drawing blood, you learn by, start by practicing on one another, and that's what we did. And so one day, a, a classmate of mine was checking my blood pressure, and it was, uh, it was really high. So, but she was brand new to, to, to measuring blood pressures, thought she didn't know what she was doing. She rechecked it, it was high again. And then we brought in the, the uh, supervisor, the faculty, the doctor, and it was high. And he said, yeah, you know, I think you should go to the student health clinic and get this checked out. So I went a few days later. And when you have high blood pressure, the first things a, a, in a clinic, what they'll do is they'll draw blood, they'll you know, get a urine sample, make sure there's not anything else going on. So what they found when they did that was that I also had some early signs of, of kidney disease that went along with that, which is a known outcome or complication of high blood pressure, right? One that's more common among African Americans and has a worse course. So for me, this was really uh, striking. I was 23 years old. Um, I was 15, 20 pounds lighter th than I am now. I uh, had played college basketball. I was, you know, really thought I was in great shape, very robust and all this sort of thing. And here I am being told that I have this health problem as well. The same thing, problems that I'm learning about in the classroom were then sort of uh, affecting me in a very personal way. So that sort of kind of led me on this sort of whole kind of uh, reformulation of, of what I wanted to do in medicine and, and, and where I wanted to go and, and sort of trying to solve these problems. And so that's sort of the, the, the foundation of how, we are, how, so how I got here today. So, you know, uh, what I would say, so for the next few, few slides, and these are things that you guys are going to be pretty familiar with, I'm just going to kind of try and talk through them. Um, so, because I want to get to the other part, which I think would be more interesting to you guys. So there are basically all sorts of factors at work that are accounting for this why. Right? The question is, why are there these differences, right? So there are huge structural, systemic issues in place that really impact health in ways that was not apparent to me when I started medical school. So when you're in medical school, you know, they're focusing just on the sort of the, the science, the, you know, this is that, this, these are the facts, these are the facts, without that sort of social context, right? And so the way that I sort of learned about this, and so even though I grew up in a, a lower middle class background, my mom worked, my dad worked for a grocery store. I don't, I'm not sure what the grocery store is here in, in Texas. I don't know what, what the main one is, but sort of like a, uh, a Safeway or just whatever standard grocery store is. He worked in the meat department at a store like that. My dad did not uh, attend college. Uh, my mom worked at a, as like an administrative person in, a, in, a, in an office, you know, sort of in that world. She, she finished high school, did not go to college. And so, um, they had, you know, what you call working class, blue collar jobs, but they were able to sort of carve out a, they had health insurance. And so I, I was under this sort of misconception that when you have health insurance, we, you know, if you, don't have, if you don't have health insurance, that means that you're unemployed and all these other sorts of, you know, just sort of really binary black and white kind of thinking that I just didn't understand it wasn't being taught about in medical school. So early in medical school, I got the chance to go to a, a, a clinic that was about an hour and a half from campus. And in that clinic, uh, it, the town was half black, half white, and, and the town did not have any physicians. And so Duke had established this relationship with the town where students would go out there and rotate once a month to this clinic and sort of provide care to people in this sort of really kind of really suboptimal way. It was basically like a trailer, and, or a, this time it was actually a one-room house back then, now it's a trailer. And you're just delivering sort of piecemeal care to people. Uh, and it was, it was, I was struck by several people in the, in the, that I write about in the book, people who are quote unquote, doing things the American way, the, you know, they have jobs, they're married, et cetera, et cetera, and continuing to just fall through the cracks. And it was really eye-opening to me um, how complicated these issues were and how problematic and how much what was happening on the outside was impacting, you know, what we could do with, as a doctor. It was just, it was continually striking to me. And it wasn't something that we were getting in school, but I had to learn kind of on my own. And so these are just examples of all the things that uh, impact health. Uh, do you have health insurance? If you do, what type do you have? Where do you live? Where do you go to school? These are all factors that, that are just tremendously, you can never overstate how important these things are. So I'm in the mental health field, and these issues are even, um, some, in some ways, even worse than they are in the, in the general medical field. So I want to give you, so th this, these slides give you some information, but I want to give you a kind of a vivid illustration of how that might play out. So one night I was in an emergency room, 
uh, as a psychiatry resident, and there were two women that came into the emergency room with very similar problems, very similar problems. They both needed to be um, hospitalized, at least in the short term, to kind of get them over the crisis that they were in. Very similar stories. So the first, first person was able to go up to upstairs to our university hospital unit, which is, you know, generally, as far as mental health units go, was nice. Um, you know, it had small numbers of patients, more staff, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other person, however, because she didn't have insurance, had to go to the, the state hospital, which is a very different experience. I worked in both settings. So the state hospital is a setting where people are much more aggressive. Maybe they have criminal issue, issues. Um, not a place for the kind of uh, problems that this woman had, but this is the only place that she could go because of these logistics of insurance. And so to make the complicate matters worse, further, um, because it was a separate hospital, we had to go through this process where she had to be transported by, by police. So she had to, this is her first encounter with the mental health system, and she has to go in a police car, uh, you know, treated basically like a, like a criminal for having a uh, mental health problem, right? Uh, and so you can imagine how that informs how someone then f follows up with mental health moving forward, right? And all too often, that kind of example, I mean, it was, just, it was really striking because they were back-to-back -back patients. And so even though it wasn't a, strictly a race thing in, in, in per se, it was playing out along racial lines. These class differences were playing out along racial lines all too often. And so it was, it was just really striking. And, the, and these sort of slides, this, this information just sort of gives voice to that, the idea of how African Americans are more likely to receive care in these suboptimal settings and the implications of that in terms of health problems and health, and, um, and health outcomes. So I think that's a really important piece to the puzzle. There's another important piece, obviously, the doctor-patient relationship and, and how that can go awry. So we have a long history, obviously, in our country of, and sometimes people are tempted to think that this is a distant past that has no present day implications, but it certainly does, of mistreatment at the hands of the healthcare system. And so that informs not only the way providers see patients now, but also the way that patients in turn see the healthcare system and providers, right? It kind of can go both ways. So I'll give you a couple examples. So in the book, um, I talk about a couple, a couple ways in which this plays out. There's one story in there about a, a young, a middle, an African-American man who's kind of blue-collar background, comes to the hospital with a physical problem, chest pain. You want to make sure he doesn't have a heart attack. We, we do all the usual medical stuff. But what comes out of that is that the doctors, so when they have this discussion when he's ready to leave the hospital, there's a back and forth about how to manage his blood pressure, his high blood pressure. He wants to lose weight, eat better diet, very sensible things. The doctors are fixed on this idea that he's got to take medicines and that he can't, he's not capable of doing these other things. I mean, that was more or less what it came out to be. And so when we left the room, it, 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 the discussion became not about his medical issues, but about what was wrong with this guy. How could he know so much about these lifestyle things, and how could he know so much about this? And they end up giving him a, a mental health label, which was just astonishing to me and just so troubling to me. Uh, another example I can give example is a more personal one. So I was a, um, so in my early 30s, um, I was, um, so I'd, in, I'd played basketball in college, injured my knee, and several years later, I re-injured it playing tennis, but it was, wasn't nearly as, as severe. And then I was at home one day in the yard, working, working in my yard, it was, it was really bothering me, and I think I, I, said, I need to get this checked out. So I went to an urgent care clinic. So not an emergency room, but an urgent care clinic. Now, I wasn't that busy that day, um, and the nurse there was very nice. If any nurses in the room, this nurse was, uh, was very nice. But then, so then the doctor comes into the room, and so the doctor looks at me, well, actually doesn't look at me. He looks at my leg, my knee, um, and then sort of looks at the computer like this, and then just sort of says, well, stand up, sit down. Um, never really looks at me at all. And then just says, well, okay, you're fine, you're, you're okay to go. But kind of like sort of just pushing me out, pushing me along. Now, I'm not someone who normally wears the label of being a doctor. I'm not someone who goes into the room and the first thing I'm going to tell you when you meet me is that I'm a doctor, I went to Duke and all this sort of, that's not the way that I sort of project myself. But in this case, I felt like, gee, I, this is not right. I should say something. This is not cool. Um, and so I, I did it initially subtly by giving him some sort of medical references, medical terminology. I didn't say I was a doctor, right? <laughs> But here's the thing. So here's the, here's the deal, though. But then he's like, then, he's, then he looked at me. And he's like, "Well, are you a are you an X-ray tech or something? How do you know?" So that was his first reaction to me. It was still this this way of this way of sort of limiting who I could be and what I could be, right? And so then I said, "No, I'm actually a physician." And then once I did that, the whole interaction between us completely changed in ways that were just uh, mind-boggling. Like like I mean, you, you, people have heard that, that maybe doctors get maybe maybe you can get a, a sooner appointment with co for the colleague or something like that but this is completely different care so what this guy ended up doing was he, he looked at me first and he, he started a conversation the first time he actually looked at me in the eye as like a real person and then we had this exchange and he was suddenly interested in me right when he, before he wasn't 
And then he examines my knee. So this is the thing. First, he didn't do that. So then he examines my knee, says, oh, we need to get an x-ray. We need to do this. We need to do that. And so it was like getting two different levels of care and being two different people, right? And one, so the first person was just me as this guy, random person um, coming from my community. Who knows what he may have thought of me? You know, I had sweatpants on. I had tennis shoes. I was not dressed like this. And then, I, then once I became this medical person, I was suddenly a different, you know, everything completely changed. So you can imagine how those dynamics play out in, in the real world when doctors see patients. And I certainly have seen many examples of, of that play out, but I thought that was a really vivid illustration of how that could play out at, at being two people as one. And one person being, you know, two different people in one uh, setting. So this, you know, so this next slide will look at some kind of, uh, this is looking at some of the, the uh, this is, I probably need to update this slide, but, but this is looking at some of the uh, history of the perceptions and ways in which doctors might perceive patients. There's a recent study that came out from the University of Virginia. Uh, people may be familiar with it. It was about pain control and uh, this idea that African Americans are somehow uh, immune to you know, pain or their nerve endings are more resistant. And this is, a, this is a study that came out of the University of Virginia just a few months ago, and they surveyed medical students, right? And a large number of students were still having these beliefs uh, in mind. And so, so these things are not, these things are still persisting uh, and are very troubling. Um, and so one of the things that I, I tell people is that um, what it speaks to is this idea that there's this, there's this sense that somehow doctors are magical and if they have this great education and they're somehow different than the rest of society. But, you know, we, we grew up in the same society and are informed by the same beliefs and problems that the rest of the society is. So these are things that really need to be addressed within the medical school uh, curriculum. So uh, the, the flip side of that I wanted to just briefly touch on is this idea here. This idea that we have this history of, of bias and mistreatment and how that informs how people then perceive the healthcare system. So what I, often what happened to me as a, being one of the only African American providers in a clinical setting is that I, I would go in there and uh, the medical team would sort of have all the sort of appropriate treatments presented to the patient, but the patient wouldn't, they wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't, they honestly think that the doctors were somehow lying to them or trying to experiment on them, all these other sorts of things you would hear people say. And so the, I would be put in this role as like a mediator or, or a translator, if it will, and it was really an awkward thing to always sort of be put in that position, but be trying to assure the patient that indeed this doctor did have the best intention and was actually trying to do things right. So it was a role that I kind of would, would find myself in quite a bit as well. So. Uh, that's, this is certainly a really important, huge piece to the puzzle. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip through part of this, but I think one important part I want to mention was uh, I told you in the beginning that um, I had high blood pressure. I think it's a kind of important point to tie up. So one of the, there are a couple of points I wanted to bring up about that, which I think are interesting. So I was 23 years old, um, really healthy, at least I thought. I'd come from a community where people didn't excel, African-American men in particular. So I had several neighbors, uh, one guy across the street from me who had been incarcerated, a couple years older than me, and then he got uh, murdered in prison, and a, a couple other people in my neighborhood who had similar kinds of stories where they got incarcerated for different things. And that was sort of kind of the tra trajectory. So s the success that I've had um, was something that was certainly unique to the kind of community that I grew up in. And there's an interesting um, term you may or may not be familiar with, but I wanted to mention to the audience. There's a term called um, John Henryism. There's this idea of, of African American. There's, there's a famous folk legend of an African American man in the early 18, 1800s who was so proficient at uh, drilling spikes in the railroad that he was better than the steam machine. But then he, he, he so he succeeded in facing these great obstacles. But then he died. He dropped dead suddenly. Right. So the whole point of that story is that. There's been research suggesting that the African American people who can succeed in the environments that I grew up in actually have, there's a health toll that kind of comes with that, um, which is interesting. And so, so typically we think of people who do better in society being more well off as having better health. But there's sort of this paradox often that African American uh, people who are succeeding often are not healthier than the people that are not as well off as them. So it's a really interesting paradox. And so this, is, this study here kind of plays out to some extent that, that, that point. So Meharry is an African American medical school in, John, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And so there was a doctor there who was sort of collecting data on his medical students back in the 50s and 60s. And these are all African American medical students. And this is back in the days when it was basically all men in medical school. And then Johns Hopkins had a similar uh, study that they were sort of doing as well. And eventually these two investigators sort of paired up and compared data between the two institutions. I think it's a really fascinating um, study. And they found that the African American physicians did have more health problems. Uh, both at baseline and over time. And I think part of that is this idea of people, will, people in society may look at, well, you're both at the same level, you're both doctors, you're both whatever, but then it doesn't account for the extra challenges, the journey, the uh, extra stresses that, that are involved and tailed in that. So I think that's just an interesting point. So for me, it was really difficult to make health changes. I was so, so focused on trying to 
succeed and get through and prove that I was, I belong there and all this kind of thing that I sort of neglected my health in a way. Um, but then there was also this other challenge for me as an African American coming from a lower income community, uh, trying to adopt healthier lifestyle because it felt like it was somehow giving up something for myself and my community. And so it's, and it's a kind of challenge that I've seen a lot of patients that I see over the years deal with and talk about. So I have very really candid discussions with patients about this. And I think so being a doctor who can understand that issue and be able to relate to patients with that issue is a really important thing as well. So I think that's the lesson from there. So, so the postscript for me is that I took blood pressure medicines for a few years, four or five years probably, but I was able eventually to um, work with my diet and things and I've had normal blood pressure for several years now. And so uh, it's a lesson that I like to impart to, to the patients that I see um, over time. So I wanted to switch gears. So uh, this is the other part of the story of my book about what it's like to be an African American doctor, uh, a medical student and doctor, and what that experience is like and how that experience can be different in many ways um, from the other, other students that are in your course. So I had a chance this morning to talk to some of the uh, medical students here at this institution. And I was, you know, uh, some of the things that I talk about here are things that are still going on. And so that's uh, in some ways, you know, troubling in some ways, but it also informs the, the relevance of this story. It's not just my own personal story, but it's a, it's a larger story. So it's all about perception. So if someone sees me, what do they think of me instantly, right? So this is some of the ways in which I've been perceived, and I'll, I'll talk you through some of these, right? So as a first year medical student, I, I was in a lecture hall one day, um, early in the year, and I was coming into the lecture hall, and then it was a, it was a break, and then we came back in the lecture hall, like after a bathroom break, came back into the lecture hall for the second lecture. The professor was up here at Pullman and, and, and came all the way across the classroom, confronted me, asked me, you know, are you here to fix the lights? Okay, so my, my first response was to think, you know, maybe he, maybe he, was, he misheard me. I mean, maybe he was, maybe he's thinking about someone else. Maybe I looked around and said, well, is there someone else here? You know, is it me, sort of thing. And then I said no. And then he, and he sort of amplified. He said, well, I called you last week about this. Why haven't you done this? Um, I didn't realize I had a twin at the medical school, but I must have, right? Um, and so, so that was his response. And I was like, you know, um, no, uh, I'm not here for that. And then he said, well, then his response was, why are you here in my classroom? And so it was a very sort of conf confrontational exchange, right? And it was and sort of, I was already an inse feeling insecure about being at Duke. Coming from the background I did, the, me and my classmates were very well off, parents were, were very successful. And, and so that was a, a, a very uncomfortable experience. And the first chapter of the book sort of talks you through um, sort of the mental challenges of that. Because you, you want to, you who, who do you share that story with? Do you, what do you do? Do you confront the professor? Do you tell the administrators? Who's going to understand you? Are they going to think that you're just trying to cause problems, you know, it's, it's such a complicated uh, dynamic and so many students go through these sorts of issues. So a few years later, as an intern, a medical intern, so this is when you have the MD behind your name but you don't really feel like a doctor yet, um, I was in the hospital one night and an elderly white gentleman uh, came in and this is what he said. Um, so it happened, so you know, I don't want a, you know, inward doctor. Um, it, it turns out there were actually, and I was the only African American doctor, which is not an uncommon experience for me. And there were several medical teams in the hospital, and it just so happened I was the only, he happened to be assigned to the team with the only African American doctor sort of thing. So whether that's karma or whatever you want to call it, that's what happened. And this is what he said. And his daughter was one, um, so it's in North Carolina, and she had the, uh, a shirt with the Confederate flag all, all across it. And then a, another family member had a, a tattooed Confederate flag, which I thought was, I'd never seen that before. Um, and uh, so my first thought was that, gee, this is really not going to work out, right? Um, <laughs> So, because so, you can imagine their negative energy towards me, but you can also imagine I had a lot of negative energy towards them, right? And so, uh, if, as a flip side of that, so, the, you know, the story ends up having a better ending than you might expect, but again, it speaks to this, 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 this unique sort of aspect of experience of being an African American, uh, in the, particularly an African American man. And so these are some other things that people have said. You know, people have sort of mis mistaken me for or thought I was. Now, the basketball thing, okay, so I'm really tall, right? You know, that's, that's well and good. And, it's, and sometimes it's fine. You know, I did play basketball. It's nothing to be ashamed of. But what would, what would be troubling was that there'd be some patients who would think that that was the only thing that you were capable of doing. And so at one time, a patient said, well, gee, and he, and he actually said this. He said, you know, a black with long arms and long legs should only be playing basketball and nothing else. Like, wow, really? Is that, is, I mean, so, and so his daughter uh, was so, dismayed and embarrassed and she like cursed him out and I mean so uh, so I'm glad she did that so I, so I didn't have to. Um, uh, but uh, so that was, so there were all sorts of experiences like that that were problematic, right? Really problematic. Um, and so this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I've had so many emails and calls and, and letters from physicians 
Uh, this is not just like, so some people have tended to think, well, this is Duke, Duke has some kind of racist institution, that's just a Duke thing. Or you're in the South, this is North Carolina, it's a Southern thing. Hey, doctors from every corner of the country share these exact same stories, many much, much worse than what I experienced. So this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of this larger um, you know, problem or, or, or challenge that, that we face. Now, on the flip side, there's, there's the obvious sort of experience I've had where African-American patients are really happy to see someone like me. And then there are these sort of situations where you're not sure what to make of it. <laughs> In some cases, I think people might be well-meaning. It's a difficult conversation to have. They don't know what to say, and they, they really mean well. And then there are other cases where people really think they think really low of African-Americans, and they sort of see this, they just can't believe it. And so it kind of it's flip sides of it, right? And so that's sort of the, some of the challenges of my experience that I've had. Um, there's this other piece that sort of, sort of emanates throughout the entire book. This idea of sort of having dual identities. I went back to that again, the symbolism of being a black man in a white coat. So the community I grew up in was very, the patients we would see were very similar to my own family members and the community that I grew up in. But yet I was becoming part of this other medical world where the people were much, tend to be much well off, much more affluent. And so there was a struggle to sort of figure out where I fit within that, within those two worlds. And this is a photo of uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who's a famous African-American philosopher from the early 20th century. He coined this term double consciousness, this idea of sort of being in two worlds and, and sort of going through life, sort of, think, sort of perceiving yourself, sort of seeing how you are perceived by two different, both groups. I'm, not, I'm, really, I'm really doing him justice. He's probably turning over in his grave now. But, um, but you know, the sort of seeing how the African-American community is perceiving you at the same time you're concerned about the, the, the white community perceiving you, and sort of this dual identity and all the sort of mental energy and strain that goes along with that. So this is an interesting point. So part of the reason why people look at me so strangely is because I, in some ways I do, I am sort of an isolated kind of breed in, in, in a way within the medical world. So this is an interesting report. This came out in um, uh, September. August, so right before my book came out. It's from the AAMC, which is an organization that sort of, um, they represent, and they put out publications about academic medicine. Uh, and so, and they represent all the academic medical institutions. This is their finding. So, there are slightly fewer black men applying to and getting into medical school in 2014 than in 1978. Wow, right? 36 year time period. A lot's changed during that period of time. So, the, the U.S. population has gone up a lot in 36 years. The population of physicians has gone up a lot in 36 years. And in most, most subgroups of physicians, the population has gone up a lot. There's a lot there are a lot more you know, um, you know, Latino physicians, a lot more Asian physicians. There are actually a lot more African American women physicians than there are now than there were then. But among African American men, we have this sort of uh, unique picture. And so what you'll see in medical schools, almost everywhere you go, you'll see medical school classes where there are three or four African American women for every one African American man. And so if the question is, what, the, what is that all about? Um, I have my thoughts about it. I'm curious if other people have their input as well from the audience if we have time, if I um, can talk a little faster. Um, I have a couple thoughts about that. So I think there's this perception game, this idea there's external perceptions of what it means to be an African American man, there's perceptions of threat and violence and, and criminality, and then there's also these perceptions of sort of success through sports and, and athletics. And so I think that narrows the lane in which people, African Americans, can see themselves, particularly men. And so I think of myself as a young man growing up in the community I grew up in. Uh, 13, 14 years old, I would never have imagined the idea of being a, a physician. This wouldn't have even been something that could have been imaginable to me. The first time I ever saw an African-American doctor, I was uh, a male doctor. I'd seen women, African-American women, never seen an African-American male doctor. I was 17, I had a, a back injury from, from playing basketball. It was an older guy, and so I was thinking, wow, that's pretty cool, you know, African-American doctor. He must have gone through all kinds of things to get where he was, but, but, but he was much older, so I couldn't totally relate to him in the way that I would have liked to have. But then the following year, in college, I, I had a summer internship, and I met an African American doctor who was in his 30s. He was a cardiologist, and you know he had trained in the University of Maryland and at Johns Hopkins and, and everywhere. And, and it was like completely eye-opening. This is a guy who sort of had a similar background to me, kind of looked like me, and he was actually in this place where he was succeeding, and people were were looking at him in this different way, and it was amazing to me. And that was really the first time that I ever considered becoming a physician. I mean, honestly. So, so just the idea of having someone who looks like you, who you can see in that role, how important that could be, and how profound that could be. Even though I was good in school, I had no concept of what I could actually achieve because it, the expectations were just so limited and so narrow to what, what, to what it meant. So I think that's a really important point. I think in some ways it plays out even more for African American men, um, but it's even, even more so than, than African American women, even though it's important there as well. The next couple slides I'll go through, we'll try and go through quickly. Look at some demographic data, which I think is really important here. So just to kind of quickly go through these. So the African American population is about 13% U.S. And you can see as the numbers, as it go down from medical, trainee, medical school to trainee to practicing doctor, the numbers continue to go down. So about 4% of African American, 4% of practicing doctors are African American. 
Now, what would happen for me a lot of times is I would come to a clinic, and uh, I was in a psychiatry clinic, and I was the only African American provider there. And the clinic served a population that was half African American. And so I would get the, all these requests constantly to sort of see African American patients. Now, whether it was coming from the patients, sometimes it was, sometimes it was coming from the providers themselves who were saying, this, we think this is best for the patient. It would work both ways. But I, would, I, was, I was one person, and I would find myself just sort of getting all these referrals and having this sense of like, well, I ended up having like two or three times as many patients as my colleagues, and, and sort of feeling like that was somehow unfair, and I'm still trying to learn my craft, why is it that all this is happening to me, sort of thing. But it speaks to this numbers game, which I'm going to sort of uh, play out before you. So this is some demographic data here. The red is African American. You can see in the U.S. population it's 12 or 13 percent. In North Carolina it's about 22 percent, so it's, it's, it's higher as most southern states are. And then in Durham, North Carolina, it's in the high 30s about 39%, so about three times the national rate in terms of the African American population. This is how it looked, but that, that pattern, and in, 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 I know this is a busy slide, but this is a really important one. So um, look at this, so you see how Durham is 38% African American, but look at these other cities. These are all cities with several major medical schools, and you see the same pattern play out replicated nationally. And so even in the cities where there's a, a, a lower, relatively lower African American population, the numbers are still considerably higher than the national average. So you have this pattern nationwide of schools being, where, where young doctors are being trained, where these prestigious medical, medical centers are existing, that are situated in these communities that are lower income, often large African American populations. Often there's a tension between the communities and the universities. So you see this play out, this sort of, this sort of mistrust and, and things play out often. And, and, and so it's replicated nationwide. It's certainly not something specific to my own experience. So this, we showed this slide already. This is just a couple of some data on the mental health field, which I think is interesting because you know, mental health, this is my area, of course. This is an area where you're really talking about the most important and intimate issues in your life. And a lot of times patients would come in wanting, for instance, marital therapy. And I have requests, they say, I'd want an African American provider. There wasn't one to find. It was this common pattern that I would see uh, a lot. Um, we can kind of go through these slides. I'll, I'll brush these because I want to leave time for questions. The point here of these slides is that there has been, there's a body of research that suggests um, that not only African American providers are more likely to serve in underserved communities, that's been established, particularly in the primary care and mental health fields, but there's also some perception, there's also a perception among many patients that this is in some way uh, provides a more comforting medical environment for them to be seen. So we'll just kind of skip through those. So I wanted to finally kind of conclude with this. I think this is really interesting. This is the perception of how the books have been received in the world. And I think in some ways this speaks to these issues in, in a way in which me giving a lecture um, maybe can't. So when I first got the, when I first sort of sent the book out into the world, this is the, uh, the, the literary world takes place in New York City. And this is, these are the labels that many of the people who are in that industry would put on themselves. This is not me sort of, this is the labels they would sort of self-describe as. And so when I first sort of put out there, these are a couple of samples of how people would receive the book. So this first person here, and this is actually, there were several people who felt this way. They said, wow, I've never heard there were anything such as racial differences in health. This is really interesting. This is amazing. I, it was almost as if I had like uncovered some secret, you know, I'd, I'd cured Alzheimer's or, or I'd solved the, the mystery of cancer. It was, it was amazing. It's like, this is readily available information. But, and I don't say it to, to sort of um, be negative about those folks, but it, it sort of speaks to this idea that these can be very well-meaning people who can live in a world in which they can, can be totally separate from these issues that are so important uh, to, a, to a large segment of the population. And, and, and so, so, so what that told me was that there was a real important piece of this book and just in terms of education, informing people about these larger problems, because you can't really address problems until you really know that they even exist, right? And so that was, that was a really big piece there. Now there were some who didn't uh, receive it the same way. This person was a, uh, a former journalist, and they said, well, I'd done a couple of stories about this, and I talked to some doctors, and they said that all this is really just a behavior of the black people, of black people in the community. And she said, I talked to some doctors. I wonder who those doctors were that she talked to, right? Um, and I'll have some more about that in, in a little bit. And so I figured this might not, we probably wouldn't work well together. Um, and then this is the third one. Uh, I don't think people would find this useful or interesting. So, this, so a lot of people wanted me to strictly talk, you mentioned Freddie Gray. So a lot of people thought that I should only talk about race and criminal justice. And, and I thought, well, there are a lot of people out there who've written really good books about that sort of subject. There's a really important story to tell about medicine and healthcare and these challenges. And that's the field that I know. And so, th so that sort of uh, spurred me on. Now, whenever you write about these issues of race and medicine, you know you can't make everyone happy, right? So there are going to be some people, and so I'll give you a sense of that. So, and this, this is really important. So, so you guys have all seen online where you write articles and there's comments to the articles and, and the comments can be very malicious. People will say things that they probably would never say to you face to face. So I've certainly had plenty of that. 
But what I've also had, which is more interesting and maybe troubling, is I've had emails from, from people expressing their views. Now, it's one thing if you're just sort of a random citizen who doesn't, who's not in a role where you can actually um, do anything about this. But then, there, but then I had several emails from physicians, practicing doctors, who had really negative things to say about what I wrote. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I wanted to share some of those with you. And I don't, I don't do this to sort of bum you out or anything, because these, these this is definitely the minority of people. But I wanted to just sort of illustrate some of the challenges that are still, we still face. So one doctor said, it's all about class. You're seeing a racial problem that doesn't exist. And then he kind of goes on about me being a Duke professor. Um, so race is a certain, I mean, class is certainly a big part of this puzzle. There's no doubt social class is a big part. Teasing that out, race, class and race are so often still intertwined in our society. Um, so I, I reject the idea that it's strictly class and, and race has nothing to do with it. I don't think that's the case. But, but the point is taken. But here's the next, here's the next uh, comment. You are grossly mistaken. The day when race or ethnicity had to do with the quality of patient care has been a relic for decades. So this doctor is saying that at some point that was the case maybe, but now everything is completely different. Uh, I thought that was interesting because he mentioned being working in a, in, a, in a community clinic where he saw a lot of lower income patients. And he, and he stated that you know, he himself was not biased, which, which very well may be true, but he knew for a fact that the patients themselves had no concerns about these issues at all in terms of seeing providers who weren't like them. And I, I thought that was interesting that he could sort of read their minds and know what they were thinking in that way. I'm a psychiatrist. I know that you can't read people's minds. I'll just tell you that. Um, and so I thought that was interesting. Now this person said, uh, the next one said, you did the en entire population of non-black doctors a disservice by trying to convince the public of your misguided thoughts. So you know, I actually wanted, some of the best feedback I've got from the book has actually been from people who are not African American, uh, women doctors, Jewish doctors, Asian doctors, people from other fields, I mean, other, other perspectives who can sort of, my experience can inform some of the experiences that they've had, right, in some ways. There's parts of my story that are relevant to their own story. And so I think that, so I, think that you know, I certainly I would object uh, to that characterization. Because um, I think I've written about it from my own lens through race and medicine, but th this, is, this applies to so many other uh, lenses as well. And then the final one I think is the most troubling one. The health problems of black people are solely the fault of black people. So here's the thing. So here's the point about that. So if you're a doctor and you already, a patient comes to your room and you already believe that before you ever even talk to the patient, imagine what that, how that impacts everything that proceeds from there and follows from there, right? Just imagine if you already have that in your mind that this is what's going to happen. And so I think that's a particularly kind of troubling um, you know, commentary. It shows, it shows some of the you know, challenges that we still face. Now on the flip side, on a more optimistic note, the vast majority of my feedback has been positive. Now I anticipated when I wrote the book that the younger group of medical students and doctors would, would be able to relate to my story. Um, but, then, but then I've also had other things that, that I've really appreciated. There have been many African American patients who said that they've sort of valued my sort of self-empowerment message about taking better care of your health, using my own story as an illustration of that. And then I had many readers, I say white readers here, but it's been many, many other groups of folks who've really been able to sort of uh, tap, tap into my story. So I've had several classmates from medical school People that I knew, we went through the same classes, same rotations together, who, 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 who contacted me since the books come out. And they, and, they just, and they were all just so amazed. They were like, they had no idea that these things were happening. They had, they had, they, we often, they had like just different experiences in so many ways. Even though we went to the same school, same hospital, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that was also telling as well. Um, but most of them were very, you know, they were most of them very troubled and very positive about how they per perceive things. Now I think at Duke, so this book came out last year. I started at Duke in 1996. I don't think that um, in 1996 Duke would have received the book uh, very well at all. I think things have changed in some ways quite a bit. Um, and so in some ways that's a testament to progress. Because when I first started at medical school at Duke, there had never been a, a senior person in any leadership position at Duke who was not, um, you know, who, who was a, a woman or a minority, never. And so since that time things have changed a lot. And, and some of them have made a really uh, concerted effort to sort of bring these issues to the table and to talk about these issues. So I think. You know, this is just sort of summarizing what we already talked about. So I think what I would say to this is that you know, these, are, these are huge issues that we're talking about. Um, there's, system, there's so many ways to tackle these problems. There's so many ways. So for me, writing was my way to sort of put this story out there to get people to talk about these issues. There's so many ways. So people tell me, well, where do we go from here? What do we do? Um, in the book, in the end, I talk about some of the, some of the challenges. Like I talk about how healthcare system, how the healthcare um, we expand in healthcare, but we still have it in some ways, and, and, and all the sort of politics of how the politics of healthcare have kind of really messed things up and are still disproportionately impacting the minority community. So I talk about these issues. Where do we go? So sometimes people might think that some people have this message of feeling kind of um, powerless in some ways, and, and I, I want to always I always like to end with this sort of point. So 
there are obviously a lot of system level political issues that need to take place and need to be involved with, and I'm, and I'm happy to talk more about that. But there's never discount the role of the individual and what you can do as an individual person as well. And so while certainly African American providers have, have like, for instance, Dr. Bryan and many others have played a great role in that, it's not solely up to the responsibility of African American doctors to solve this problem. And, and, and so I really want people to, um, to, to not lose that message. And this idea of like, what can you do? So I'll tell you a little story about my own personal background. It's not medicine, but it's related to this story. So when I was in eighth grade, I went to a middle school that was um, what would be called a low performing school. It was 98% African American. And a, 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 a middle-aged white teacher, she's in her 40s probably, she said, uh, you know, you, you, you've done well in our math class. Maybe you should try and test into this magnet program. So it was just like a, a separate school I would have to go into for high school. Now, no one in our school had done that. None of African American students had done that. My first inclination was to say that, that no, that wouldn't be something I would do. I, I told her no, basically. And so she persisted. And she got my um, mom involved, which I guess is the way to make it work, right? Um, so she got my mom involved. And then I went through this test. And, 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 I, and I, you know, to my surprise, I, you know, I had really, you know, I inter internalized all this sort of negative self-belief about what it meant to be an African-American man. People don't realize how, how powerful those external messages are, and I internalized a lot of that. And so I'd never thought that I would do well on this test, and I did on a whim, and I got into this program. And that really, um, you know, changed my trajectory in terms of beginning to change my trajectory in terms of where I could see myself as being. And so I think we should never lose sight of, of, those, of the role that we can be as individuals in this larger problem. Even if we can't fix everything, and then there's a lot of work to do at the big level, we as individuals all still have the, have the tremendous power to make a difference in, in folks' lives. So I think I'd, I'd like to conclude my remarks here. And if there are any time for questions, I'd love to answer them. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we had a technical problem with our microphones today. They were causing a lot of feedback and screeching. Consequently, we don't have the floor mics that we usually have for Q&A, but we believe we can do Q&A anyway. It just requires that if you have a question, we'll call on you. Please stand up, project your voice, and be succinct with your questions. Um, please, though, uh, the floor is open for questions for Dr. Tweedy. And I see Taddy McAllister, so I'm going to call on her first. And then I'll let you take it from here. Okay. So, so, so I was hoping I could have the mic and walk around like those talk show folks, and, but oh well. <laughs> if you, one thing that would help, though, is if you would repeat the question yes. so everybody can hear it. I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, she said, well, well, how do I attribute my equanimity? Nice, nice big word. How, how, how do I, uh, what do I attribute that to, right? Was I born that way? So now there were times in my life where I was very um, angry about the things that were happening, um, very angry uh, about some of these experiences. I, I, looking back, I think that, you know, you know, me having this high blood pressure, my blood pressure was really high. It was like you know, 160, you know, 90, 100. It was really over 100. It was really high. And I was wondering if maybe some of this, remember I mentioned about this whole John Henryism thing about sort of fighting and fighting and was that taking a toll on my health? And so I think I started to realize I had to sort of uh, try to let go of some of these things and take a different tack. I was angry, but I, and, and I wasn't really getting anywhere. And so, I, mean, I was exceeding for myself, but trying to like be angry at this person and just, and just being angry with them wasn't helping me. It was, in some ways, it was probably hurting me in some ways. And so I think I let go a lot, a lot of that. So I think if I'd written this book 15 years ago, it might have been a different sort of book in some ways. Um, yeah, so I don't think it was, I wasn't always that way. No, it, I, I certainly felt the unfairness. I felt the anger, the hurt, all those sorts of things. Um, but I've tried to come to a different place in my life. Um, you know, so that's sort of how I would answer that question. There had to be more questions. Come on, it wasn't. I didn't. Thank you for your volunteering. <laughs> oh, a couple. Okay. Yes. Just, okay. So his question was whether the Tuskegee experiment had any impact on African Americans being willing to see, a, see um, physicians. So just to kind of briefly, the Tuskegee experiment, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically it was a US public health service study conducted from the 1934 to 1972, testing the natural course of, basically looking at the natural course of syphilis in African American men 
Uh, the, even though treatment was available uh, towards the early part of the study, didn't, didn't offer treatment, didn't let the men know they had syphilis. It was a really egregious uh, you know, misuse of justice, uh, power, everything. So what's the impact of that? What's the legacy of that? In some ways, it's the um, tip of the iceberg. I mean, you know, there's a lot of other stories that, uh, that aren't as well known that have a similar um, uh, problems, right? And so one of, the, one of the challenges of teaching that story, it's a really important lesson to learn, right? We need to know about it, but then what, what I've seen a lot of times now is that people say, well, oh, well, we would never do something like that, so if, we, if we're not to that extreme, then of course, then we can't have any problems at all. Like they were saying, well, if I'm not that racist, then I can't be racist at all. You know, this, it's sort of this extreme, so it can kind of be used in a way that can often, in some ways, maybe not be as helpful as it is. Uh, the truth of the matter is that there's certainly that legacy, that old history that's passed down. Like even though, but even though I didn't know about uh, Tuskegee when I was young or growing up, I still knew this old history of how several of my relatives would go to doctors and be mistreated or misdiagnosed. So Tuskegee is just sort of like the tip of the iceberg. Um, does that impact the way people perceive uh, the healthcare system? Absolutely. And so there are doctors, there are patients, I have several patients who would come in and use these words, I don't want to be experimented upon. Or my guinea pig. I mean, I would hear these things over and over again, and that's certainly part of the legacy of those studies, and many other things. And you hear these terms over and over again, and you know when they're saying that what they mean, where they're coming from. I know someone else had a hand up. Okay, you, you, okay, there are actually a few. Wow. Oh, the, you mean like the um, the ones where the the more negative comments? The more, the, the, which, which quotes you mean? The, um, the one, okay, so yeah, the, so he, his question was were, were the quotes that were uh, that put up there, were they all for men? Now, the ones that were from physicians did happen to all the uh, male physicians. Um, they were all uh, somewhat older physicians, so you know, there's, there's a lot of other things that work. They're probably they're all over, over 60, um, so there are a lot of factors that work there. Yeah, so, I mean, so that was the case. Um, I hadn't really thought about that in that, in that sort of way. Um, Yes, yes, yeah, I mean, there could, be some, there could be something to that. Yeah, certainly. Yes, ma'am? I, I sort of describe what? Imposter. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yeah, the question is how did you overcome? So, there's this idea of being an imposter, this idea of affirmative action. Um, and people perceiving that you don't belong and you're not qualified and all those sorts of things. Yeah, you know, it, it took a while, you know, because you know, those are things that you think about. I mean, so for me, being able to succeed was one way to, to validate that. But even once you succeed in one form, it, when you get to the next stage, it still kind of comes up again. And so it would still kind of continue to, to be there. Um, I got to a point where I life where I kind of realized that some people were always, there would always be some people that were going to think less than ideal of me and I couldn't control and this is part of the anger and letting go of things. I couldn't control what, what necessarily what everyone thought of me. I would have to pick my battles. Uh, and so that, that, that sort of would work for me because I would, would see, there are students that I knew who sort of let this consume them to the degree where they were not able to kind of move forward. And so I didn't want to you know, find myself in that situation because I, I mean, so, so that's sort of how it worked for me. Um, there's a better answer in there somewhere, but I can't seem to dig it out. <laughs> I, I think I might come back to that one though. I'll try though. Yes. How, how is what? Change my view of what now? Oh, that's a great question, right? Yeah, so, yeah, you know, part of that was, because I remember I mentioned at the outset I was one of those folks who was, would, have been un, would not have been likely to write this sort of book when I started medical school. Even as I got through my, my training, you know, there was a part of me that was sort of feeling like I'd gotten through things and I was, had a successful life, et cetera, and maybe it was feeling I was getting too distant from, from, from my past in some ways. So in some ways this book was, my, it was an effort for me to try and reconnect uh, to that and to, to recognize the importance that some of those other folks had played. Like I mentioned that doctor, how important he was in me becoming a doctor, and sort of trying to find a way in which I could kind of give back in a way, I mean, it's, it's, and people always use that term, um, but it really felt like I was at a place in my life where I, I wanted to sort of um, be more involved and more engaged in that, in that way. So I f found myself talking 
you know, the interesting thing about speaking is that I'm not a natural, you may have noticed this, I'm not a natural public speaker, and um, the idea of being in front of large audiences is actually like, when I first started this, it was, I, I called it exposure therapy, because I'm a very, uh, you know, person, like, introverted person, um, and so putting myself out there is not natural to me, um, but I felt like there was this important part to, uh, that I needed to do, and I couldn't just be successful just for my own self, in my own way, in my own cocoon, and so I've been reaching out to, you know, younger African American students, particularly African American men, uh, to, and thinking about ways in which I can be even more um, effective in that way. So that's certainly changed uh, my thoughts in that way, uh, the way the reception's been to the book. Yes, sir, I, and I'll get you next, ma'am. Wow, that is a uh, incredible question. He says, what advice would I give to a second year medical student about to start their clerkships, about uncovering their own biases and taking care of patients. Wow. <laughs> uh, great question. Because um, some of it, some, a lot of it varies. I mean, you can't, it, it's not one bl blanket set of advice that's going to necessarily work for everyone. I do think that um, not isolating yourself, some people, uh, I often see this with my African American students, they isolate themselves. Uh, and that would be very problematic, so not isolate yourself. To be able to bounce things off of people, have a, have a group of people that you can bounce things off of, I think is really important. I mean, really important. Um, not losing sight of what your goals are um, is also really important. As far as this idea of, of bias, everyone has that bias. Everyone's, I always like to say that everyone's been, we have this history in our country and everyone in some ways has been poisoned by it. Some of us have been affected more than us, but everyone's been poisoned in some way by it. And sort of having that, starting with that framework and, real, and then realizing the ways in which that could inform how you see patients is really important. Like, you know, as I mentioned, that, that one family with the Confederate flag. Like, so I have certain clear biases against folks from a certain, you know, part of the, of the world, and, and so how do I not let that, you know, do that, you know, cause harm to that person, right? How do I do, how do I work through that? And those are, and there are cases in the book that where I talk about, you know, the challenges that are inherent in that, but sort of starting with that framework, you know, that we're all, all you know, fallible in that way, and then it, I think is a real good starting point. All too often I would see doctors who are, have the sense of infallibility, which is just so problematic, and this idea that you've, you've, you've gotten to this MD or PhD, and you're in this residency, and et cetera, et cetera, and that somehow you're immune to these problems, and that's just a, so starting with that framework is so problematic. So I think that's the first step, to have a little bit of humility in that way. Yeah, but yeah, so yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay, so her question was, uh, she's a book lover, and, and she asked if um, there's another book that I might want to write. So. Great question. So I've been thinking about that, and um, one of the things that, you know, the, this book mainly talks about my experiences in medical school and my sort of internship medical year, and very little about psychiatry. So one thought that I've had is to sort of write a book that um, explores some of these issues through the mental health lens, because in some ways they're even more troubling and problematic, and, and I, I, I haven't quite crystallized it, but I think I want to write something more that looks more specifically to the mental health field and the challenges that kind of come from, flow from that. It looks like the speaker has told me that I have to, but the, the music's playing in the background, like in the shows, time to be quiet. Thank you again. Yeah. Let's applaud. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Tweedy, for your message. To the audience, there is a reception in the Holly Auditorium lobby at as you exit, there's some refreshments, and there is also an opportunity to purchase Dr. Tweedy's book, and he will be here for a brief period of time to sign the books. And thank you very much for attending our Frank Bryant lecture. We're adjourned.